You are listening to the Challenge and Choose Radio Network. Now your host of your show, Chad Butler. Challenge and Choose Nation, welcome, welcome. This is Chad Butler, your host. We'd like to thank you for joining us here today, December the 12th, 12th, 12th of 14. Uh, I don't. I hope all of you have your shopping needs done. Uh, I've got with me here today, uh, as always, producer Jake. Jake, how we doing? Always amazing. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Hey, Jake, I've been telling you about today's guest. He's a guy that I've known for a long time. He's that guy that just kind of has that it factor. I'm excited to bring him on and introduce him here in a little bit. As you know, Challenge and Choose Nation, we are doing a series on what it takes to become a one percenter. So if you're a guy out there that owns a business, if you're out there in the sales field, this is a program I think you're really going to relate to. We're going to kind of dig a little bit deeper today on what it takes to take those quantum leaps in business, uh, going from the 20 percent to the 5 percent, or if you're a 5 percenter, how can we get you to that 1 percent? We've had shows dedicated to believing in yourself. We've had shows dedicated to fear. Today, we're going to talk about something that's very, very important to me. It's very, very key to the challenge and choose system. And it's the idea around storytelling. We're all excellent storytellers. And what I mean by that is this. Whenever we're uh, faced with a challenge, our mind goes into hyperdrive on stories. And in most cases, the emotion that is predominant is fear. When fear comes into play, we start to tell ourselves a very elaborate stories that we start to attach to. The challenge and choose model is new story, new life. So when we recognize that we're getting results we don't want in life, if we go to the story the, where it, it, everything originates, our belief system, our mindsets, that's where we have to make the tweaks in order to get new results. Thus, new story, new life. Every one of us experience it, you know, in business and especially in sales. The, the psychology of sales is, is really identifying what our stories are, Jake. If we're successful if we're, when we're feeling it and we're in a groove our stories are awesome but as soon as we're faced with adversity those stories change and in my experience those stories can prevent us from having the successes we want in life oh absolutely so today i wanted to bring on an old colleague a dear friend someone that i know intimately that i've known for a really long time and i brought him in because this is the, this is one of those guys that is what I would call has that it factor. I think anyone that knows him would say he's got that it factor. He's had his whole life, you meet him, he's just got that air of confidence about him that you, you just don't want to challenge him. Like he's, he's the guy in the office that you don't, you know, I don't know that I want to be on the wrong side of the ledger with him. You know what I mean? Whether it was at a basketball game, you know, a fist fight or, or playing Monopoly, you know, and I'm a competitive guy. And of course I would take on any challenge he gave me, but in the back of my mind, I'd be like, this guy's going to bring out everything in me. Do you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Bring out the best in you. He's going to bring out the best in me. So I love him dearly. Wes Patterson's our guest from Salt Lake City, Utah. Wes, welcome to Austin, Texas by way of the airwaves. Welcome to Challenge and Shoes Nation. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, thanks, Chad. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. How were how was the weather out in in Salt Lake City today? You know, we're we're actually enjoying uh, I believe the high is sixty degrees today on December twelfth in Salt Lake. It's unheard of. Wow. Uh, so we're we're enjoying it while it lasts. We got a big storm rolling in tomorrow. So that's what I uh, hear. You know, California got hammered. I mean, mudslides. They got some serious rain. Is most of that yeah. storm going to miss Utah West, or are you guys going to get some of that? You know, I heard it. We're going to northern Utah is going to get hit pretty hard. The, it's going to split, and so southern Utah will be okay. But up in our neck of the woods, we're going to we're bracing for rain in the valleys and a couple feet of snow up in the mountains. Nice. Well, good. Well, so, thanks for coming. Are you uh, you and your lovely wife and kids all set for the holidays? Yeah, yeah, we're good. We've got uh, Santa's been busy. We I think we're all uh, we're all set. I just have to. 
I just have to get something for uh, for the wife now. <laughs> the uh, the the toughest one of the year. And if you're like me, <laughs> if you're like me, I would always wait till the end. And sometimes when you get to the mall, they're like out of what you went for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you, you have to get creative. And I got to tell you, Wes, honest to goodness, I remember buying like some really neat gifts, like. That on, on uh, like December 23rd, my wife's like, oh, how did you know? And I totally just went in to get three different things. They were all sold out, and I just bought what was left. <laughs> <laughs> Have you experienced oh, that hey, before? It's the thought, it's the thought that counts, right? That's what they keep telling me. So it, <laughs> she, she typically takes everything back anyway, so I've never been too concerned. <laughs> Right, right. Just keep that gift receipt, and you'll be in business. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us today, Wes. You know, we've kind of talked off air about business and about life, and I've loved, I've always loved your stories, and so I thought, this is a program on storytelling, and I think some of the things we've talked about, you know, off air are so relatable to everybody. As a matter of fact, our conversation has helped me out tremendously. It's helped me kind of redefine uh, how I view and challenge the thoughts that come into my mind. So if you wouldn't mind, Wes, I mean, if I'm off base with any of these stories I'm about to share about you, please, please uh, let me know. Wes, Wes grew okay. up, Wes uh, moved to Utah when he was about nine years old and from that moment on became a stellar athlete. I'd like to ask him, like, how that all began. In high school, you were, you know, if not at Allstate and three sports, you probably should have been. You go on to play college football. Uh, excelled in college, that translates into you going getting an MBA, which kind of just speaks to your pattern in life of, of being a one percenter, uh, always wanting you know to be the top of your whatever you're doing. Then then you go into business on your own and had a lot of success there, which I'd like to get to. So throughout your life, you've had an air of belief in yourself. Can you speak to that a little bit? Where did that originate from, that belief in yourself, that that belief that you're capable of doing uh, whatever you're, you put your mind to? Sure. Um, I, I would say it started uh, with my parents. You know, I, I grew up in a, uh, I was born in a small town called Lacombe, Louisiana, uh, which is just right on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain down, down in south, uh, southeast Louisiana. Uh, very humble, situation, you know, we had a gravel road that led to our, our small uh, two-bedroom home where my parents raised uh, my younger brother and I and our our two older sisters. Um, when we moved out to Utah, my uh, my parents were looking for better opportunity for my, my sisters in terms of education and, and you know, finding a, a future spouse, etc. Uh, as you know, a young kid, I, I didn't really know anything other than the bayou that I grew up on. Um, and, and my parents instilled in me a belief system that whatever I chose to do in my life, uh, whether it was sports, uh, schoolwork, friends, uh, anything, that I could excel uh, if, I, if I put my mind to it. If, if it was something that I really wanted, something that I believed in, uh, I could achieve it. Awesome. And Chad, I don't know. I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my end. Are you guys getting feedback? Um, we're not. It sounds perfect on our end. We apologize. I think I, uh, producer okay. Jake probably could hear that on his end, and he made some changes. Hopefully it turns out okay, better. Great. So, Wes, great. thanks for sharing um, that. I, I, I can appreciate the experience uh, as a child being being told that you're capable. A lot of kids hear that. You've got to appreciate a lot of kids – uh, have that positive reinforcement. Can you can you speak to an experience? Let's maybe start with sports as a as a kid, whether it be little league or maybe high school. What was kind of a, a defining moment where you applied, where you had to kind of learn it on the field per se in life and applied what your dad taught you or your parents? Sure, I, I would say that first real. Uh maybe inflection point or learning learning opportunity for me came when I was nine years old. Um, I was playing little league football. Uh, the league that we played in had a weight restriction or weight limit to where if you were over a certain size, a certain weight, you, you had to play on the line. My parents wanted me to uh, you know, have the opportunity to be a skilled position player. My grandfather played tight end for the Chicago Bears back in the old leather helmet days. Nice. They, uh, they, they 
felt like, uh, you know, I had some, some good blood or some good genes. So they played me in the older age group, one year older. And so as you can imagine, as a nine-year-old, you know, I, I uh, was playing with kids that were a full year older than me, and the difference in age, you know, is significant uh, at that stage in life. Sure. Uh, most of my teammates were, were quite bigger than me. They were more aggressive. They they had been playing together as a team since they were seven and eight, so they, they had a history together. And I was kind of the new kid on the block and was timid and, and fearful. And I'll never forget uh, you know, up to that point into the season, you know, starting the season, going through camp and, and the first few games, um, I really was regulated to the bench. I, I didn't play a lot in practice. I got kind of beat up, you know, uh, run run over and, and thrown around a little bit. And I was just really reserved and timid. Uh, I was the second string running back. And in a game, our starting running back got, uh, got to win, knocked out of him, got hurt, or I, I don't remember what happened. But he came out. And the coach said, Patterson, you're in. So uh, I remember going in thinking, oh, my gosh, I am scared to death. I hope they don't give me a ball. I hope, I hope you know, that it's a play that runs away from me. And, and uh, sure enough, the first play was a, a 44 cross, uh, like a power running running play right to me. And uh, You, so you, you remember the play, play, don't you? You remember the exact play of that I, day. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. 44 cross. So, nice. Um, I come out, you know, break the huddle. I, I can remember just feeling just just so scared. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this is going to be a nightmare. So what were the stories? I really quickly, what were the stories? What what were you telling yourself as a nine-year-old? Nine-year-old Wes is afraid. Were the programs about storytelling? I want to take a moment of break, a uh, pause. What were you telling yourself? Uh, you know, I, I was telling myself, a couple things. One, I'm going to fumble the handoff. <laughs> uh, two, two, I'm going to. I'm, I, if I'm lucky enough to, to get the handoff, I'm going to get hit so hard, it's going to just knock. You know, they're going to kill me. I, I was scared for my life. I, I, you know, I thought I, I can't. I can't withstand these kids. You know, we were playing a, a team with a lot of big Islander boys, and and uh, I was scared, scared to death. Uh, I was scared. Uh, you know that I all the hard work and the effort that that. Uh, had gone into, you know, the years of working in my backyard uh, with my parents, with my dad. You know, they're over on the sideline cheering and, and so excited that I, I finally got in the game. I was scared I was going to let them down. I mean, all, all those fears I can remember, and I, I apologize for the emotion. Um, but, but thinking about it really brings it back, you know, brings it back to life. <clears throat> so I get the ball, and sure enough, you know, I got rocked. I mean, the middle linebacker stepped up and just blew me up, right? And I remember, I, I distinctly like it was yesterday, this morning, um, popping up, you know, adjusting my chin strap, uh, thinking to myself, holy cow, I didn't fumble. I'm not dead. Uh, it really didn't hurt. I can do this, right? I, I, I immediately had this, this, this feeling like, I, I can play with these guys. Like I, you know, I'm not going to be injured. I'm not going to get hurt. I can actually, I can actually do this. And Chad, I'll tell you, the rest of that game, um, it was probably one. You know, it was one of the greatest the experiences, greatest memories I have of playing little league sports. I ended up, I ended up scoring two touchdowns in that game. I ended up rushing for, you know, several, several yards, and and uh, and from that point forward, I actually earned the starting running back position as a nine year old playing with ten year olds. And the entire rest of my little league experience, I, I frankly, I, I really don't remember ever not being in the game as as the running back. Um, and it all be it, it was all because I think the lessons that my dad and mom taught me as a as a little kid, preparing me, and sounds crazy, but preparing me, uh, you know, all those hours in the backyard playing with my little brother with our you know makeshift uniforms and equipment, but just practicing, juking, <laughs> practicing handoffs, practicing route running, practicing, you know, all those things, um, I was able to apply it on the field. And, and once I overcame that fear, like I was going to fail and I wasn't prepared, I wasn't ready to, to step into the limelight, as it were, uh, with those boys, uh, it changed, it changed my, you know, as crazy as it sounds, my little league football experience. And, and would, could you, would you agree that potentially your life, I mean, potentially, yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I've, I've got, uh, you know, as I continue to grow and, and get into, 
you know, the upper upper ages of the little league system, you know, 12, 13 year old, 14, and into high school, um, you know, I, I was that guy. I was the leader of the team. I was the team captain, you know, every year starting my from, from being 10 years old and up. And um, I, I believe it did because of the confidence that I had in myself, that, that you know, uh, belief that I can do anything I put my mind to, whether, again, whether it be we're talking athletics right now, but whether it was athletics or, or social settings or, you know, church or, or whatever the case may be, uh, I, I think it was a, a defining moment in my life. Defining moment, and, and you mentioned something that's really important to the Challenge and Choose Nation, that belief, that mindset, that you could do anything, and the results came afterward. Now, I want to go back briefly, Wes, because I, I haven't asked you this, and I'm dying to know, what was that reunion like back with your parents at the end of that game? What were the emotions you <laughs> felt? And I want to know what your dad said, if you can recall. You know... <clears throat> I, I am an you know this about me. I, I I am an emotional person. I wear I wear that uh close uh you know, on my sleeve. You, you always know if you can get my, my eyes opened up I'm I'm gonna let it flow. So I'll try to be I'll try to be strong here. But I I remember um, walking over to the sideline when the game was over. You know, we always have the, the little team meeting with the coaches and everything and um my dad <laughs> he, he had the biggest smile on his face gave me a big embrace, and, and he just told me, son, son, I'm so proud of you. And it's crazy to think that the emotion is so real to this day. I love I know, it. I know that my dad, um, he's not one of those dads that, that lives through his kids, right? I mean, he, he, uh, he inspires, he motivates, he, uh, he expected a lot. Uh, you know, from us and, and my all my my siblings, but he gave uh, he gave love, he gave uh, comfort, he gave instruction, discipline, all those things. But uh, I remember as a kid just feel, feeling that um, just that sense of accomplishment, that sense of love. Like you know, I I uh, validated maybe all the work, and it seemed like a lot of work. You know, looking back, maybe it wasn't that much work, but all the work and time that he would spend with me. You know, after his long days at work and after, you know, him feeling tired. And now that I have my own children, you know, I can appreciate uh, the commitment, the sacrifice, and the effort that it took on his part to help prepare me uh, to be, you know, not only you know, a good athlete, but a, a good person, a good human being, a good father, a good, a good businessman, et cetera. Oh, I love it. Um, so... Yeah, thanks, thanks for making me. Uh, thanks for making me open up and cry to you. Hey, you know what? This is what it's all about. I mean, what makes this so real, Wes, is we can all appreciate it. And and if you'll allow me a minute, you know, the stories we tell ourselves are the results that we get in life. And what I'm appreciating about this particular story, and I know you've got a lot more to share with us today. Uh, you're nine years old. You've got this fear. Uh, you don't want to get your bell rung. It's going to hurt. You could physically get hurt. You might disappoint your coach. You might want. You might disappoint your parents, your mom, your sisters, your your fan base. there on the sidelines. You know, you hadn't been starting up to that point very much. You're nervous. You're the youngest kid. I can only imagine the stories that were going through your head at the time. I'm sure there were a lot that you don't remember, and of obvious ones that you have mentioned. When you stepped into it, you obviously had enough belief and courage to step into it in spite of the stories that you're listening to. And it sounds to me that when you straightened out that helmet and dug the, the grass out of your face mask after that first collision, you said to yourself, I can change. This story is not what I thought it was. Would you agree that the stories that were going through your head, you discovered in that moment were not true. Would you agree to that? Yeah, absolutely. They, they weren't fact, true. I, I was, they weren't true. And, and the story immediately changed uh, in my head that, you know, now it, it was interesting. The fear was, all of it was gone, immediately gone. As I got up and got back to the huddle, <clears throat> the story then became, okay, how do I, how do I juke that guy? How do I, how do I outrun somebody? How do I stiff arm somebody? How do I get in the end zone? This was, the, the mindset was totally different from that point forward. I love it. The, when the belief changed, going forward, Wes, this is a really important thing that we're going to apply to business and life here in a moment. So 
up to that point, practices probably weren't real as fun. Um, how you viewed yourself probably wasn't the greatest because you were kind of the bench guy to some degree. And now you've got two touchdowns or so under your belt. Uh, you're dominating. You're probably making great runs. Even on the plays that you're not scoring touchdowns, you're evidently showing that you can handle the rock. Are, we, are you with me? Yeah. Practices yeah. change. How you how, at home, how, how did that affect? I'm sure when you're home playing with your brother, when you're in the backyard with your dad, when you're around your sisters, when you're at play uh, with kids in the neighborhood doing basketball or some, some other sport, did that confidence and the story, the new stories that changed, did that translate into other areas of your life? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, no question. I, I was more, uh, I think I was happier. You know, I, I allowed myself to be uh, maybe a little looser, just, just, you know, less uptight, more, more fun probably for others to be around. Uh, I, I can remember very well being um, almost, almost Freed, almost lifted, you know. I, I uh, there was a, a young gal um, that lived down the road from us. He, she had Down syndrome, and um, I remember, I remember distinctly always feeling like I was somehow responsible for her and making sure she was okay and people weren't teasing her. And, and you know, even as a nine, ten, eleven year old boy, she was a few years older than me, uh, just two years older, in fact. Um, I remember. Just feeling like I could stand up for her and for others that much more forcefully because I just had the confidence. And I think it all, it's crazy, Chad, but it all comes back to that belief in myself that changed, you know, and, and call it that specific moment, that inflection point in my life. Um, but I became a better buddy, a better brother, a better son, more motivated, a better student, my teachers. I would say, you know, people could remember, uh, they would probably recognize the change in me over those over those few weeks right after that, that event happened. So imagine if nine-year-old Wes would have been given the opportunity to run that ball and you declined it. The fear, the stories, you would have said, no, coach, no. You just kind of shook your head and it, you're in the moment of a game. He goes find someone else immediately. That was five seconds of Wes, do you want the rock? Or Wes, you're in. Or maybe you take the handoff and just kind of uh, go to the dirt at the first contact, right? <laughs> and and don't yeah. and don't step into it. My point is, in life, in business, I've met so many salespeople, Wes, as as have you. I've seen a lot of business owners who uh, are new into their careers and don't give themselves the opportunity of going through the line and taking that first hit and recognizing that the story was fake. In other words. They took a course of action that was safer, and the safer course of action kept the story real, right? Because they didn't face it fully, and so they kept in the story, and the story became the self-fulfilling prophecy. So, on one hand, if you face it and recognize, oh my God, it was just, it was fake. It wasn't real, and it changed the course of your life. Can you, do you appreciate that? Absolutely. That's yep. what we teach yep, people sure. at Challenge and Shoes is it's the, the fear creates the story. And if we believe the story, it becomes true. If we face that dragon is what I call in my personal life. When I face the dragon, what I find out is, is that there's no dragon. So we've spoken uh, about this before, and I've always been fascinated. I did not play college sports. I, I was a relatively successful high school athlete, but... Uh, really had no business playing at the next level. I just didn't have that ability like you did. When you got picked up by a major university, mind you, um, as a local Utah athlete going to a local Division I program at Brigham Young University, what was it like going on campus? Now, now keep in mind, you were recruited there. They believed in you. That must have been quite a thrill to be recruited by a big division one school and be accepted you know your, your your dad again is just proud as hell of you i won't make you relive that and have you get emotional again but uh yeah, which, which we love by the way uh but talk to me wes when you get to byu whether it's your first practice your first time in the weight room your first time conditioning when you first get there that first did you did you get there in the spring or the fall when, when did you first uh enter camp yeah, so we reported we reported in the in the late summer, okay. uh, it was in August, 
um, reported for, for you know weigh-ins, physicals to you know to to, uh, to get ready for the Cuba Day uh, camp. Um, I, I uh, it was a it was a very humbling experience. So so keep in mind my my trajectory uh, when I got into high school. You know I, I became the all state quarterback. Uh, started started quarterback as a junior senior. Played varsity as a as a sophomore. Uh, two sport athlete, baseball. You know, so I, I was top of the game. I get to BYU, feeling like so. You had you know, a ton of confidence, is what you're saying. You had a ton of confidence. Oh, yeah. You had you Absolutely. had the experiences. I mean, to be an all state in any state in America to become all state, that's that's legit. That's for real. So you get to BYU. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we we were a five A program as well. So a lot of the kids that I was all state with as, as seniors in high school uh, were also part of that. Recruiting class, so get to BYU, <clears throat> go through the physicals, go through all the testing and everything, and, and we get to our first our first practice, uh, an early morning two a day practice. And uh, you know, keep in mind at the time they they pretty much isolated each position group, uh, you know, during the testing and, and enrolling and all that. So I I haven't seen the full team yet. I just seen the other running backs and uh, receivers. So we get to practice. Um, you know, they, they, we go through individual drills, and then they put us in what's called a uh, a seven on seven skelly drill, where the running backs and the receivers uh, are running pass routes against the linebackers and uh, defensive backs. There was a linebacker uh, that was our middle linebacker, Rob Morris, was, uh, is the name. He, he played several years in the NFL. I totally remember Rob Morris. Yeah, they called him Freight Train Morris. Absolutely. So, uh, he, he, he welcomed me to the to the program. Uh, first, first, first or second play, we, uh, <laughs> I was I was lined up in the slot. They had me run a crossing pattern, and uh, you know, next thing I remember, Chad was was literally waking up on the sideline with uh, with the cold compress on my head because Rob <laughs> Morris had just literally killed me. Just, just he lit me. you I, I up. Oh man, killed me. You know, keep in mind, I'm I'm about a 200 pound, you know, five foot ten and a half, five foot eleven, 200 pound, you know, athletic fast runner. Here's a guy that's six three, two fifty, and every bit as fast as me, and strong as hell. So, uh, and just oh yeah, I mean, he could run through, he could run through five brick walls and keep going. Who was the quarterback at the time? Because I'd like to say that guy, that guy, hung you out to dry. <laughs> Yeah, he sure did. It, uh, you know, it was a guy named Drew Miller. Great, great kid. He, he ended up having a great career. Uh, but we were all on the scout team facing the varsity, varsity, uh, gotcha. linebackers and DB. So funny. Uh, anyway, I remember going. So that, so that was my first kind of real wake up call to, okay, I'm in a, I'm in a whole, a whole different level of, uh, of athletes. <clears throat> we went through the rest of the week and there were several more like experiences of me just getting rolled up and, Beat up pretty bad. Um, I I remember calling. It, it was it was uh, I believe it was a Saturday night. We had just had our first scrimmage, and um, I didn't get a lot of a lot of time. But when I did get in, you know, I tried to do my thing, but you know, I, I I was not what I thought fast enough. Uh, all these guys were so. I was one of the smallest guys on the field. Uh, I, I think in fact the kicker and the punter were probably the only two that were small. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I remember standing in the huddle literally, like, feeling like I was just with giants. You know, these guys are 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, these big offensive linemen, 300 pounds. Several of them played in the NFL, John Tate, Joe Long, um, big running backs, you know, Kalani Sataki and these other guys. And I was just a little bitty guy in there. And I remember calling my, my girlfriend at the time on, uh, on a Saturday and just, just breaking down to her, I, I was fearful to call my dad at the time because I, you know, he had experienced, I'm sure, so much joy and pride as a as a father with what I accomplished up to that point. I didn't want to call him. Call my my girlfriend at the time, and I tell her, "Honey, I I cannot, I can't hang with these guys. They're they're so much bigger than me. They're as fast or faster than me. They're stronger than me." Like I just can't compete. I, I need to. I just need to come home because this is not fun. Uh, I'm scared. <laughs> you know. I'm, again, it's not like that same story I was telling myself as a, as a nine year old. These guys are going to hurt me. I'm going to. I'm going to. You know, fail. And it, it's going to be a disaster, and I can't do it. How many guys do you think uh, there? Uh, other athletes there in camp. Do you think felt the same way, Wes? Do you think? Do you think a large majority of them had 
some thoughts to that? You know, I would think so. I would think especially so. the new guys. Yeah, yeah, the new guys coming in because again, when you get when you get recruited and you go to a major university, every single athlete that's brought in mm-hmm. were you know those guys were the they're the top guys. Of their high school, yeah, they they were the guys, and so all of us to come in and to automatically be regulated at the lowest end of the you know the totem pole. And, yeah, you, you were know, all I, state. I You're an all state guy. Everyone there yeah. is. So, so real quick, Wes, right. uh, before we get the response from your girlfriend and, and what your next decision was, let us go to break for a commercial for a moment. So Challenge and Choose Nation, stay with us. We're going to be coming right back. We're going to take a 30-minute a, a 30 30 break. We're going to come back, or 30-second break, and we're going to come back with Wes. We're going to find out what happened next. Stay tuned. Are you sick of dealing with pain? Did you get hurt in an auto accident? Do you have a sports injury? Do you stand on your feet all day and suffer from lower back pain or migraines? Call Dr. Rob, 512-762-3082. Challenge and Choose Nation, welcome back to the Challenge and Choose Radio Network. I'm your host, Chad Butler. Of course, our guest has been Wes Patterson. He's been sharing us with some tremendous stories uh, in his life as a, a superior athlete coming out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, Wes, thank you for being vulnerable. I am like thrilled to find out what happened next. You're, you're at BYU, you're feeling like everyone's better, bigger, faster. You're you're going to your the love of your life, your girlfriend, your 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 now wife, uh, lovely Kirsten. What tell me what were the stories and what were you starting to believe about those stories? Well, I think the stories were uh, you know kind of what you just said. I'm I'm not I'm not fast enough. I can't compete at this level. You know I I uh, I'm a failure because I can't I can't stand up to the expectation that. The coaches had uh, in me and, and what they saw in me clearly wasn't reality that I uh, that there was really just no way that I could I could succeed I can't, I can't compete with these guys right um, and and frankly feeling like a like a you know just I was just disappointed I didn't want to disappoint my dad I didn't want to disappoint my family all my my high school teammates that were proud of me for you know, representing them and um, our school and, and all of that. <clears throat> I, I remember that weighing heavily on me. How, how difficult, uh, Wes, I mean, speak to this for a moment. You're an all-state <clears throat> high school athlete. You're a two-sport star. I'm imagining you're, you're, you're exceptional a lot of other sports as well if you would have played them more, more you know, wrestling, basketball, whatever it would have been. Sure. So you had all these experiences for the last – four or five years of being really at the top of your game and now you're here what's it like feeling that vulnerable what's it like thinking that you're kind of at the lower rung of things and disappointing others you i don't imagine you had that experience too often up to this point no it it was it was horrible it was depressing I, i can remember feeling uh you know just anxious the anxiety the uh, the fear, it, it almost was paralyzing. And it carried over into, into academics. Uh, you know, BYU is a rigorous academic environment. Sure. Uh, trying to trying to learn, you know, uh, my ways around campus and, and the coursework and all the, the, the academic load in addition to the weight room and the nutrition and, the, you know, the strength and conditioning coach, the, the playbook uh, was – a hundred times bigger than it was in high school. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, it, all of it was paralyzing, and, and I was demotivated. Um, it was a horrible. It was a horrible situation, and it, it happened so fast. I mean, but you can imagine the the excitement and the thrill of being at the high, play yeah, at at, at, uh, at that school, uh, and then within literally within a week, a week time, crashing, feeling like crashing. You know, going from high as high to I'm a loser, you know, I'm a failure. I'm not capable, I'm not right. Yeah, I can't do it. I so can't, literally I cannot do this. Now I have to ask you, and I didn't I, I don't know the answer to this. Well, I gotta ask one thing first. What was the play when Rob Morris 
put you on the sideline. Do you remember what that play was? <laughs> I, I, I actually I do. It was the, the play was Trips Wright, so I was the inside slot guy. It was Trips Wright, uh, State twenty three flood left. So I, was, <laughs> I was running the crossing pattern to the left hand side. And I oh, I love it. it. So just say the whole thing. Just just say it like the quarterback calls it out in the huddle. Give us the play. Yeah, he's gonna come up and come into the hall. He's like, all right, guys, we're gonna go. We're gonna run trips right, state twenty three, flood left on two on two. Ready, break. So when you That's when you're right. lining up, when you're lining up, you're just an option, right? You don't you don't know that the ball's coming to you at this point. Is that right? That, that's right. I'm running my pass pattern. You're just doing and, your and route. A little bit. Yeah, I'm just running my route. And, and, <laughs> and to be honest with you, I, I don't even think the ball was in the air when he hit me. Like, he just hit me. <laughs> you know. They, they, He's like, I'm not letting anybody cross into my territory without getting completely lit up. And, and oh, he, that's he classic. Uh, he certainly did it. So, so the question now is, Wes, and well done. I hope I, I don't know how many more stories, but I'm going to ask if you knew the play, whatever the story is going forward. So let me ask you something. You, you had the high. You said in a week's time, and now you're hitting kind of a paralysis low. At any point, I'm just curious – did you revert back to that nine-year-old boy at any point at, at, at in this moment of your life? You know, I did. Uh, so, so, so my girlfriend, you know, she was encouraging. She told me she loved me no matter what. You know, very supportive. Uh, the next phone call was to my dad, <laughs> and he and he was the one that brought up that moment. He said, "You remember something when you were playing?" And this is funny. He remembered it was East. Uh, the East Leopards we were playing uh, when I was nine years old. Oh yeah, he said. You, he said you remember how you felt then. You felt the same way you feel now. You felt too young, too small, too slow. Uh, you were intimidated, and you overcame it. You know because you believed in yourself. You knew you had what it, deep down inside. You know you got what it takes. You know you got what it takes. You put in the work. You put in the effort. You've always been you know, undersized, as it were, you know. Uh, you've always had to, to, you know, compensate for your physical stature with speed, quickness, you know, and smarts, uh, preparation. But you, this is no different, son. This is no different. Embrace it. Embrace the struggle. So he actually took you and, back to that moment. And, and what was, what, what, how did it all play out for you, Wes? You know, um, so I, I was a red shirt that year. And, uh, so after that, you know, we, we kind of finished our summer conditioning and summer camp and went into the season. And, and as a red shirt, uh, the majority of my time was spent on the scout team uh, and in the weight room. And I became, you know, I gained about 10 pounds of muscle. I gained uh, probably three tenths, uh, or I guess lost three tenths off of my 40 time and um, became faster, stronger, bigger. I learned the playbook. And, and by the time my second season rolled around, um, I was clocked at a, you know, a four, my, my fastest hand clock was a four, four, three, forty, which is that's blazing. Fast. That's blazing. Um, my average 40 time was a four, four, uh, four, four, eight. So, you know, I was, I wasn't the fastest guy on the field, but I was, I was fast enough. You were moving. Um, yeah. Earned my way on, uh, you know, the starting kick returner. In fact, one of my favorite, uh, memories while at BYU was returning the opening kickoff at the. 1998 Liberty Bowl versus Sean King and the Tulane. Oh, yeah, Tulane. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were undefeated that year and, and had Michael Jordan was their, their All-American wide receiver. and Sean King was a future NFL quarterback. And, you know, they ended up beating us, but just the experience and the sense of accomplishment, you know, going from that low as a freshman <clears throat> to feeling like I was a contributor and uh, helping my teammates and you know, it, it was a great journey, um, you know, great journey while I was there at, uh, at Brigham Young. So how did this wonderful experience that you had in college, again, I know that uh, you had a great college experience uh, as an athlete. You obviously went on to have uh, a lot of a lot of positive things happen. How did these experiences as an athlete translate when you decided to get into the business world? You know, I would say... Um, some of the some of the key lessons learned as a as an athlete, especially at a high level, um, is is a belief in yourself and a belief in the work ethic and a dedication or a commitment uh, to put in the work and the effort that it takes to perform at that level. Um, 
And so as that translated into my professional career, you know, my academic career, I chose to uh, to get a, a master's in business. So I, I had earned an MBA. Uh, at the time, we had had our first child. You know, I ended up marrying uh, then girlfriend Kirsten, now, now beautiful wife. Uh, we had a, a, a two children by the time I graduated with uh, with my MBA. So that was a that was a whole other level of effort and focus and and uh, intimidation, fear and all that. But as we finished and I got into the business world, I knew again the principles of hard work, dedication, uh, belief. Um, would would carry me through, and I, I I knew that I could put you know do anything that I put my mind to, and, and I believe I could do, I could achieve it. You know, we uh, are talking to an audience out there, Wes. People that own businesses, people that are in sales industries across the board. I think what's relatable here right now that we could put a, a teaching moment to is. We all tell ourselves stories through our life's conditioning. We develop beliefs or what we call mindsets, which create our framework of life. And this is such a great example of that. The conditioning of young Wes from the from the you know stories, I'm certain well before nine years old, impacted a lot of your life. Obviously, that story was very impactful. Every one of us have these stories in life that impact our trajectory of life. And now here we are. Now here we are. I'm 43. Um, now I get to choose going forward what I want out of life. The motto of Challenge and Choose is new story, new life. Now the, the stories we tell come from all of life's experiences. You've been very generous in sharing some, some beautiful stories uh, in your life that changed your trajectory. Now, there are a lot of people out there that didn't have those types of experiences uh, athletically, but have had them in, in whatever areas of their life. But no matter what our experiences are, we're still going to be faced with challenges going forward. Um, and with those challenges, the principles still apply. If we want to move forward, if we want to get better results, we have to be willing to challenge the fear and the stories that we tell ourselves. And if we want new results, we've got to be willing to face face that that dragon in order for us to get the new better results. As a matter of fact, to become a one percenter, it's not necessarily the work that we have to do. It's not necessarily the education and, and the thought through and being prepared and all of those things matter, but those things take care of themselves when we choose to be a one percenter. And the people who are able to achieve that one percent status are the people who are willing to challenge the beliefs and the thoughts and the stories that we face. Um, I asked you, I challenged you when you agreed to come onto the show to watch the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. And what's compelling about that movie and how it relates to today's program is the character of Russell Crowe obviously had was schizophrenic and he had different personalities in his mind. And those personalities, you know, came out in such a way that they became literal for him. And I mean literal. He lived different people. He, he was different people. I, I don't remember how many uh people that he, you know, uh, that was in his mind, but he allowed those thoughts to become literal in his life. Now, that's an extreme example, but what, what was interesting on how he overcame it, to fast forward, in order for him to succeed and battle through that challenge, he had to listen to those voices and say, you're not real. You're not real. And by Owning that they're not real allows you to move forward. Nine-year-old Wes uh, believed that he could get hurt as a football player. He believed that he might not, he might disappoint, he might fumble it, he might not perform even though he had prepared, even though he had a good belief in himself. He faced it, he went through the challenge, took the grass out of his face mask, stood back up and said, oh my God, that wasn't real. He looked at that and said, it's not true, and moved on. As a college athlete, news stories come about, 
and he and by stepping into it and facing the dragon, he realized they weren't real either. They were not real. So as salespeople, we're constantly faced with these stories. Now, Wes, you've been a manager of a lot of people in sales. Can you can you see how this applies to this sales force? And can you now appreciate even more the people who aren't able to initially face that fear? Can you appreciate that their life's conditioning have given them their framework? And some people aren't ready to face that dragon. Some people aren't ready and some are. Can you appreciate how their trajectory of their life will change if they just stepped into it and then realized that it's all just a story? We get to choose the story we want to live. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I, I absolutely recognize that and, and appreciate that. You know, I in my professional career, I've had the opportunity to hire and train and work with and develop uh, probably over 100 uh, people or maybe even north of 100, 120 or so. Uh, all of these people undergo extensive interviews, uh, testing, psychological, uh, personality evaluations. Etc. And they and they they join our firm and they, they come on board as what we would consider qualified candidates. And, and it's amazing how many of those um, who come in with extreme confidence, with extreme uh, you know high scores and and all the promise in the world that turn out to uh, you know kind of go up in a flame and, and turn out to not be successful. And I believe uh, bar none, frankly, that all of them succumb to their their dragon, as you as you say, or their worst enemy, uh, which ultimately Chad is themselves. Uh, they they the fear that they have is all generated uh, from within. And the it's fabric. Would you agree? All, would you agree? It's fabricated. Fabricated meaning it's it there's nothing real about it yet. It's just a story, a forecast of something in the future that hasn't happened yet. Would you? I mean, you can appreciate that. Yeah, totally agree. You know, it's it's this person is going to say no. This person is going to be mean or, or or hateful toward me. Or somehow, by making that extra phone call, it's going to it's going to damage my you know my psyche or, or whatever the case may be. When in reality, uh, all they have to do is is you know pick up the phone, or all they have to do is is open their mouth and ask uh, you know someone to buy or someone to take action or, or whatever the case may be. But the fear the fear cripples and it eventually forces them. To fail, um, and so I see I see that every day. You know, Wes, if you'll allow me to tell a quick uh, personal story as a, a third year uh, agent in the insurance and financial services industry, I always felt uh, at times that I was on the verge of failure. Like part of my desire to get up every day was this, uh, you know, instead of chasing the rabbit, I felt like the rabbit was chasing me, like it was coming to get me, and I was always like trying to stay one step ahead, right? Of of this uh, okay. this big demon, which was failure, which was you're not going to make it. And I remember driving down the road. Uh, I had an appointment in, and uh, they didn't show. You know, go go figure, right? So I have nothing else to do for the day <laughs> except to deal with my thoughts, which wasn't pretty at times, right? And I see I see this business ahead. I'm like, oh my gosh, that was the company that I interned with when I was in high school. And there was a small plastics company that was just inside this little where it was like this little strip mall warehouse like size when I worked for them. I mean, you couldn't even find it. There was no sign. If you didn't know where to go, you would never find it. Right. That's how small they were. There were four people who worked there, including the two owners. So I was like the fifth person and everyone had a specific job. Well, next thing I know, this is like a huge business with a huge marquee. That could be seen by the at the freeway. I'm like, oh my gosh, and I thought, what if I go introduce myself to these guys? But I was so so afraid because they were pretty intimidating figures for me, and I only knew them in high school. And here I am now, uh, I'm done with college. I mean, I'm in you know, I'm now into my career three years. So a lot of time had passed. I remember Wes being just petrified, and I mean petrified of going in there and exposing myself in my new career and so forth. But I thought I was so afraid, but I, but I always had this ability of like, but what if, like, what if, like, what if something? So I told myself these stories about how I'm going to, I could be embarrassed. 
I go in there and they were so thrilled to see me and I'm sharing with them what I'm doing in the nutshell version of it was they're like you know what Chad deserves and uh, the other business goes what he deserves a good referral or two so they go to their uh, roller decks and I didn't even ask right they were just being so kind to me they pulled out three referrals and they said we're gonna call these guys first this guy owns this huge trucking company this other guy owns X this other guy owns X and I'm like couldn't be happier I mean I'm kind of like that West at BYU all-state quarterback uh, just got recruited by I mean I could not have been higher right I'm just like I can do this like these guys just gave me because I stepped into it right I stepped into the fear it not only was it not true but they gave me three great referrals and I and I'm here to tell you that I made like 80,000 bucks off of those three phone calls 80 grand it was a defining moment in my career when I called on those people I had so much confidence because of the confidence these guys showed in me it was just stepping into it and it was like an important part of my career where I it solidified in me that it has nothing to do with anything besides what I believe and I had to learn to tell myself new stories powerful message so great. so fast forward to today uh, I know that you've made big changes in your life because you again part of being a one percenter is you're trying always trying to take it to the next level so now you've made a, 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 a career path change you're trying to take it to that next level and now you're faced with some that that uh, evil dark dragon called mr. unknown you're you've got unknowns staring forward uh, you've got some new stories a new fear I can only imagine changing careers to take it to that next level in your life being a one percenter tell me what's going through your mind today um, you're, you're right the unknown is creating uh, that same that same uncertainty that same fear of failure uh, you know I wake up every day thinking you know oh my heck we, we just built this beautiful office space that you know that room for 20 22 uh, highly trained professionals to that I've got to go out and recruit and develop and train and, and fill this place. And what if, what if I can't do it? What, what if, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I'm not able to, uh, to build this thing to where it needs to be so that I can cover the, cover the expenses, that I can stay in our, in our home, that, uh, you know, uh, what will people think of me if, you know, if I, if I've made this big change and, and, uh, and if I fall flat on my face, you know, there, all of the fear uh, of, of failure is back. And uh, trying to grip with that is, is surprisingly, uh, or maybe not surprisingly, it's hard. It's challenging. It's paralysis. Scary, you know? Paralysis. But, yeah. Yeah. I find myself uh, similar to you when you're in your third year in the, uh, the insurance business, feeling like I've got all day to sit here and just and just fret and, and think of all of the reasons why I'm not going to be successful and all of the consequences of, of me not being successful and, and uh, kind of that, that death, death spiral, if it were, uh, and, and fearful that I'm going to have self-fulfilling self prof uh, prophecy. prophecy. Happen, you know? So you've got some pretty big stories that you're telling yourself. And now we've spent a whole program talking about your stories, Wes, nine-year-old, nine 18-year-old, valuable lessons were learned from that lifetime of conditioning so you've had your conditioning of all of the experiences you face so what would nine-year-old and 18 year old Wes tell modern day 2014 Wes about these stories uh, yeah you know they, they would say you know Wes buck up you know as well as we know uh, you can believe in yourself you, you do believe in yourself you have what it takes You've been conditioned and prepared uh, for this. If you believe it, you can achieve it. Uh, just get to work. What would they say about those? Right. What would they say about the stories? Would they say, "Hey, they're real. They, just fight through them"? Would they say that, or would they say, "What would they say?" No, no, they would. They, they would say, "They would say they're not real. They're they're fake." You know, the the real the real West uh, is someone that's going to be wildly successful. The the real West, the real story, isn't. 
uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to, to recruit, and develop, and train, and build this, this space. It's, you know, the, the real story is, hey, what are we going to be able to accomplish together in our community? What are we going to be, how, how are we going to make a difference, you know, in the world? How are we going to make the world a better place uh, once, once we have all the success that we know we're going to have? Those are the real stories. But I think the nine-year-old, the eighteen-year-old, uh, the twenty-five-year-old would would say today, uh, and they would say, "Stop! Stop feeding the beast! Stop feeding the fake monster in your head! Stop giving uh, it attention!" Because, right? Yeah. I want to I want to yeah. I want to address challenge and choose nation for just one minute on this, Wes, and I want to teach you a principle that's very very true and very time proven. Both stories are false. The story of you succeeding and changing the world and and uh, making a difference on the planet is also a story because it hasn't happened yet. Would you agree? Yeah. It's just a story. So what I want to teach Challenge and Choose Nation and take this uh, teaching opportunity is whatever we attach to expands. Whatever we believe expands. If you believe in the the stories of the fear, that will be the self-fulfilling prophecy or the expansion. If you believe a different story, it sounds like the story you want to believe is uh, success and making a difference and all, the, the story that you've pretty much lived already up to this point. You want to continue the story, basically. And so all I want to make a point of is we get to choose. We get the opportunity to choose which story we want to follow because they're both true or they're both not true. Depending on the attention we give it, would you? Would you? Do you appreciate that? I do. Yep. I, I, my my I my nine year old son just did a school project, Wes, on a book that he picked out from the library, and the book was called the What's It. And the have you have you heard of the What's It? The book about the What's I, It? No, I haven't. The 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 the, no. the, the, sum, the summation of this, Wes, is this: a little boy believes that there's a monster that lives in the basement, and it's called the What's It. And the picture of the What's It's this double headed you know, terrifying monster with horns coming out of his head, you know, big claws, big gnarly teeth, you know, let's just call it a double-headed dragon almost. And that lives in this kid's basement. His mom makes him go to the basement to get some some food from the pantry. And, you know, the picture of the boys going down there, and sure enough, he sees the what's it. The what's it is huge. The what's it challenges him, and the boy challenges back and when he challenges back the what's it on the next page gets smaller the boy sees that it gets smaller and he challenges the what's it again and it gets smaller and smaller and the premise of the story is that this what's it that was like you know as big as the house you know is now the size of a jelly bean and the boy looks at the what's it and says i'm no longer afraid of you you might as well go to the next door neighbor jimmy's house He's afraid of everything. You'll have more success there. He dismisses the what's it. Are you with me? Yeah. If he doesn't go down to the basement, the stories about the what's it just get bigger and bigger and bigger. To your point of feeding the story. By going down and facing the what's it, as it turns out, there wasn't a what's it. Are you with me? Yes. The premise, of the, story, the, the premise of the story was the more he faced the what's it, the smaller it got, meaning the stories... The fear slowly diminished to the point where there was no more story. The what's it was gone and he dismissed it. That's a that's a beautiful story uh, that we can all use in life that the bigger the story is, the bigger we tend to make it. And it's just that. It's just a big freaking what's it. So the, the, the story here is in life and, and we're running up against the clock. So I'm going to kind of... Uh, finish with this uh, conclusion in life whenever we're faced with fear we're faced with stories again the challenge and choose model is new story new life we get to choose what we want to believe if you stay in your fear the what's it's just going to get bigger the story's just going to get bigger and it will change the trajectory of your life if you don't face it and look into it every time I have faced my fears the what's it just goes away. There was no what's it. It didn't even exist. We can believe the story or we can face it and find out it was just a hologram. It was just a fabrication of our mind. Does that make sense? I mean, any part of our life, this is relatable. Would you agree, Wes? 
I would agree. Yeah, absolutely. And the challenge for, I think, for anybody, and certainly for me, uh, all the times I've faced this, uh, you know, I've gone through this cycle several times, it seems, this pattern. Um, when you put your head down and you go to work, uh, whether it's sports, business, family, social, whatever, that's where you, that's where you succeed. It's, it's when you believe in yourself and you put your head down and you go to work building what you want to build, that's where you win. That's where you succeed. That's beautiful. Well, well said. Well, if Challenge and Choose Nation can help you in your journey or those in your Salesforce West, you know who to call. We're here to help. We, we believe in you. What's your goal for the year, Wes? We'd like to bring you back on. One of the things that we do here at Challenge and Choose Nation is, is we want you to tell us live on air what new story you want to have for 2015. And we're going to bring you back on and see how you're doing with it. Give, okay. us a ch give us a challenge on the air in front of all of Challenge well, and Choose Nation. Yeah, here we go. So uh, it's a successful year for Wes Patterson and our organization in 2015. If by the end of that uh, 2015, we have uh, uh, grown our force, our sales force, by 10 uh, individuals, 10 new individuals, and um, I would say our production, our sales quota, uh, if we're north of uh, $1 million of sales, then we will, uh, we will have a successful year. Beautiful. Okay. Let us help you get there. I know you will. $1 million production, 10 new agents. I believe it. I feel your energy, Wes. Good luck with everything. Thank you for being a guest today. We appreciate your vulnerability. We appreciate your honesty and uh, love your stories. So good luck with all you do. Us here at Challenge and Choose Nation, thank you greatly for coming on. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Again, our, our, our program today was on storytelling, on how to become a one percenter. Uh, sign off today, Challenge and Choose Nation. Join us next time. Goodbye. You have just listened to the Challenge and Choose Radio Network. For more information on these topics and the Challenge and Choose programs, please check out www.challengeandchoose.com.